Hello, I'm Shelley Quinn, and we welcome you to 3ABN Today. We want to thank you so much for joining us, sharing this time with us, and we want to thank you for your love and your prayers and your financial support. 3ABN is reaching all of the world because of you, and we thank you for that. You know, I want to encourage you today to call your friends, your neighbors, and have them tune in to this show. We are going to hear the most amazing conversion story, a story that will bring hope and encouragement to all who are watching on television or listening on the radio. And the scripture that this story reminds me of is 2 Corinthians 5.17. And there, here's what Paul wrote to the Corinthians. He says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And certainly that could be said for our special guest today, whose name is Wyatt Allen, and he is an associate speaker and evangelist for Amazing Facts. So Wyatt, we are so excited that you're here today, that God has taken hold of your life and that you have such an exciting testimony to share. Praise God. And we are going to have a special treat toward the end of the program. We're going to be introducing your beautiful wife and daughter. Yes. Well, if you've just tuned in a moment or two late, let me once again introduce our special guest. His name is Wyatt Allen. And if you look at him, you would think with this cherub face of his that he had never had a problem in his life. But Wyatt, you are a, an associate speaker and evangelist for Amazing Facts, right. but you also have your own ministry, and that's End Time Hope Ministries. That's right. So I look at you, in, especially in the family setting, having met your wife and your daughter, and you think this young man has served the Lord all his life and never had a problem. I wish that was the case. Yeah, kind of take us back to how you got off on the wrong foot in life. Oh, well, I mean, there was... You know, it goes way back to when I was even just a little bitty kid, um, when my parents split when I was three years old, and and from there it was just a whole. So they mess divorced. Of family. They divorced, okay. and uh, my mom was actually being attacked by my dad frequently, and so she had to get find a way into a woman's shelter, and and we eventually moved away. My dad got locked up for some time, and uh, when he got out, he tried to do better with his life and get. Um, a victory over his alcoholism and various things and and he did pretty good because he wanted to get his custody back of his kids and so we uh, uh, he tried hard and he eventually won custody back partial custody and so we were back and forth between my mom and my dad quite a bit but the violence didn't end and my dad continued to use drugs and it was All still right. a mess yeah so how did that affect you as a young child growing up I know you said that there was an event when you were six years old that oh. made the newspapers Yes, it was definitely um, uh, a time when I was living with my mother in Jefferson City, Missouri, mm -hmm. and we uh, just run the streets. My mom worked three jobs to just even we, even when we were living in the projects over there. And and, and how uh, many children? There was three of us. So there's my older brother, two years older, and my younger sister, three years younger. And uh, the three of us, we just well, my my sister who stayed with the babysitter. My brother and I, we took off and would run the streets and even at six years old we would go into stores and and steal things and uh because we were little kids we can hide them and get out easy it wasn't a big deal you were little hoodlum hoodlums weren't you <laughs> that's a good <laughs> word for it uh but uh, we started um setting little fires here and there and uh just playing with fire as kids and uh, one fire got out of control and ended up burning down a whole house oh, and nice. uh and so some firefighters were hurt in that uh accident oh, what well, we call an accident that uh, child crime, yes. if you will. And so they, they arrested us kids and uh, even took custody from my mom. And so that she's actually uh, still heard about that recently when she tried to uh, adopt. And so they remembered back to the time that we got in trouble. So then they did, did they permanently remove custody from your mother? No, it wasn't permanent, okay. but it definitely uh, caused some friction there growing yes. up. And, and of course, uh, my dad has always wanted custody of his kids back. And, and both my parents remarried. And so I inherited some step-siblings and, uh, and a half-sister later. And, and we, um, it, was, uh, it was very interesting because my dad continued his violence. I was still hear him beat up my, my stepmom quite often. And okay. he would even, one time he broke the headlights. Of, she, she threatened to leave. Well, he went outside and broke the headlights of her car. 
So she yeah. couldn't go anywhere. This is a night. So what you're saying, you're painting a picture of something, and, and many of you watching actually have probably uh, experienced something like this in your life or are aware of something that goes on. Because any time that there's the sickness of alcoholism or, or drug addiction, there's just a complete chaos around it. There is dysfunction, and it, it happens. It crosses every there's no borders. It crosses every social economic uh, range, if you will. It must have been so confusing for you as a child. Now, take us forward to your pre preteen years when you started, or just as you were becoming a teenager. You actually went a step further than just pranks and petty crime. You became involved with a very um, questionable group. Tell us about that. Well, there was, um, and, and by the way, Shelley, there's definitely, when I share my story with people, I do find that there's a lot of people that has experienced similar things. And I, and I think that's why my story resonates is because it does, uh, it, it strikes a chord. People have been through these, these experiences and, and uh, but, you know, the good news is, is that there, there is hope, there is redemption Amen. and all that. And that's the story I'm really wanting to tell. But it did, it did get uh, pretty worse. I was diagnosed as, as having ADHD. And uh, so I was put on medications. And, and I, even though I tried to do okay in school, uh, I never really succeeded too well. I wasn't a very popular kid and uh, pretty much a loner. And uh, remember back was a 98, was it, or 99, uh, Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold, those that uh, shut up the school there at uh, Columbine. And uh, that pretty much was the scene that I was in during the same time. And I was, uh, I got involved in, uh, the, I was listening to heavy metal music. I was uh, getting involved into the occult. I was reading books on witchcraft, playing role-playing games like Dungeons and Dragons and mm -hmm. Magic the Gathering and reading these fantasy books. And so I was really entering into this whole isolated, um, spiritualistic type mentality. Kingdom of darkness. It was definitely the kingdom of darkness. Yes. Well, uh, as I dabbled in it more and more, and I was introduced into meeting people that were into the same thing, well, a man, uh, he performed a spell on me, a Satanist, and uh, he really uh, encouraged me to go out and find, it was, the spell worked, it was, it was magical, it really was, satanic magic I see now, but, but it was power to me back then. Yes. But anyway, he encouraged me to go out and get a satanic Bible. And so I went out and got a satanic Bible, began to read it, and uh, just, I loved it. It told me I was a god, just, mm. which is the lie of Satan you've always heard yes. from yes. the Garden of Eden. And, uh, and so I, you know, I believed it, and I, and I really wanted a power. I wanted acceptance and, and, and belonging, and, uh, and that's where I, I found it in that. But, you know, this is not the only thing going on in my life. You know, I'm, it's just at the same time getting involved in, in drugs and alcohol and um, for myself, just finding myself at every party I could. So you're seeing, you know, you see a pattern developing here. First of all, you were at a tender young age. Things were so confusing. You felt powerless over your circumstances. Mm -hmm. So this is why kids do get involved with witchcraft. They do get involved with the powers you know, of darkness you know, is they're just they don't even know that God's got a power available to well, you know I always felt judged by Christians and I never liked Christians okay and uh, even though I would, my mom would send me to church every once in a while as a kid I never felt a belonging there but among the the Satanists and, and when I was involved in, in Wick and witchcraft and the, the 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 gothic group I felt welcomed I felt accepted and they didn't judge me for my curly hair or my weirdness that I had uh, okay. or my music I listened to. And because of that, you know, um, I, I liked it. And uh, Explain to us what Gothic is. Gothic, well, that was, uh, that was a short time when we, um, when we went to our parties and raves or whatever, we would dress up. Um, uh, there, was a, there was a movie called The Crow and they would just we put face paint on and uh, black uh, eyeshadow, lipstick, fingernail polish. These are the guys too. And uh, your face would be pasty and, and various things like that. And so uh, it was just, it was a whole subculture of gloomy darkness. But now, people who dress like that aren't necessarily Satanists. The Gothics are not necessarily Satanists, but there's a lot of Satanists who are Gothic. Is that right, right, they're not mutually exclusive. They are, let me say this right, they're mutually 
I'm not sure exactly what I'm saying. Yeah, they're, they're two separate groups, but there's crossovers. Is that what you're it. saying? Okay. So you have the Gothic on one side that many of them are involved in, in witchcraft and the occult or even in the Satanism, but not all Satanists dress like that. Some Satanists would walk around, you wouldn't even know it. Now, yes. if you've heard of the stories of like uh, Roger Morneau, and yes. uh, he was deep into Satanism. I was more on the dabbler okay. side. But you are looking for power on one side, and that's why you're studying the occult and, mm -hmm. and feeling acceptance. But at the other time, if you're doing these drugs, what kind of drugs were you doing? Well, mostly marijuana, but we did okay. everything we can get our, our hands on. So this was kind of, you were trying to escape, it's an, a, a means of escape. So it, you see the conflict in this message here. You're doing drugs as an escape, and yet you're seeking this power. So what happened to you as you are just dabbling in this, something very serious happened. Well, you, you can't dabble in darkness too long before you get out so far you don't know where you're at. And I, my life was just spiraling out of control. And uh, I, because of the drug use I was doing, I was, we were committing all kinds of crimes from vandalism to burglaries to assaults. Uh, you know, we were getting arrested for possession many times, but because I was a juvenile, you know, this whole uh, occult Satanism thing happened when I was about 14 years old. And at 15, I mean, my life was just uncontrollable. I mean, I slept through school because I partied all night long. And so my, I had straight F's in school and this was ninth grade. And so I just had no um, desire to succeed in life. I just wanted to party, have fun, and do my drugs. How was your mom during all of this? What, what was her feeling? She was heartbroken. And, and this is the tragic thing about it. A selfish life isn't just about self. It, it breaks other hearts. Yes, it does. I, to give you an example, I would run away from home. Basically, I would be out partying, come home. My lights were on. I was busted. Well, forget about going home. I just went back to the party and stayed out for several days to a couple weeks. Now, you can imagine what that's going to do to a mom's heart. Now, sure, I was 15, but I was still my mommy's baby, right? Right. And, and you actually, she actually had to post a want, I mean, not a wanted poster, but a, a missing poster. A, a missing yeah. poster for you when you were just 15 years old. She did. And, and, and you know, and I had my friends all saying, your mom's looking for you. The police are looking for you. And, and I was. I was I was eventually caught several times after doing this and, and arrested. And it was actually after the final or I think it was three or maybe even four times I got arrested. Uh, but every time I was arrested, I was positive for drugs or I had drugs on me. Okay. And so they finally said, you know what, we're tired of this. Um, they, they kept slapping me on the wrist and let me go. But they finally said, we're sending you to drug rehab. We're going we're gonna to do something about this. And so how effective was drug rehab for you? Well, I, I hated it. I didn't want to go. I wanted my drugs. I didn't want to, yeah. you know, stop using them. My parties was all I lived for, my music, my friends. And so... It was actually, in, it was during the time in drug rehab that they, they sent me to, into a prison to try to scare me straight. Um, of course, that just hardened me more because, as I've learned now, fear is not a good motivator. It may, it may work it's sometimes. It's a temporary motivator. But it's not going to keep you on the right it's path. And so, um, anyway, um, I definitely planned on using drugs after getting out of rehab. But I was going to play their game while I was there. Okay, so you were pretty savvy as a kid. Now, you had a run-in with one of the counselors. That's the tragic part of this story, um, a story that I wish uh, I could tell without adding this part, but it is it's, it's vital. My, um, I, was, I was sneaking cigarettes. I told you I was playing the game, but I wasn't very good at it. Uh, so I was smoking cigarettes, and uh, I eventually got caught, and the counselor who caught me uh, had to report me, and I begged him not to. And uh, he just, uh, he had to do his job and he made me do a report. And, and I knew I was going to get kicked out of the program. And if I got kicked out of the program, there was all these consequences waiting for me. And I just didn't want that. And so I, out of the worst imaginable anger and just uh, hatred that you can imagine a person ever having, murder in my heart, I, um, I, 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 I prayed to Satan. Mm. I asked him for power. And, um, and then there, I cast a spell of destruction on this guy. And as I went to attack him uh, with a knife, mm. he, uh, he got hurt really bad. And he went to the hospital. And uh, I ended up, of course, getting locked up in the juvenile detention center for that. I was 15 years old. 15 years old. And what was the outcome of that? Um, well, uh, I was... Were you taken to trial? Were you sentenced? Well, that's a long story. Uh, I was actually, uh, I sat in the juvenile detention center for a year. 
uh, waiting to be certified as an adult because a 15 year old they don't typically send to prison but they say when the crime is severe enough they might so I had to, I had to wait for a year to find out whether or not I was competent to stand trial as an adult and after a year they said I finally was I was 16 then and that's when they uh, sent me to county jail uh, but that's not before something incredible happened okay and that's so I mean yeah I love it when you 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 kind of hit it with it hit us with it and then you draw it back because even as lost as you were, you have written, he has written an incredible book, and it is called The Least of the Least, From Crime to Christ. This book is something that will bring hope and encouragement to anybody, that you're never too far gone. So here, Wyatt, you are, you have really messed a man up. You've been you committed a violent crime yeah. by the power of Satan, praying specifically to Satan for this mm -hmm. destruction. But something happens to you while you're being detained, this 15-year-old kid. What happens? Well, I, I definitely wasn't going to... Uh, first of all, I became suicidal. I didn't want to live. I mean, I knew that my life was over. Uh, the guy, I didn't know if he lived or died uh, from this crime. I found out a couple weeks later he did live, but he had incredible injuries. Um, it was terrible. He was in the hospital for a few days. Did you had... feel remorse? No, I, I felt angry that I got caught, okay. you know, that, that, okay. that I had to go through all this. Right. No, I didn't feel remorse. Uh, I, I hated life. I hated my family. I hated everybody. Um, you hated yourself, didn't you? Well, I, I must have. I didn't think of it like that because I meant, again, even the Satanic Bible, when I read it, it talked about, you know, loving yourself as one of the ultimate things. Yeah. Uh, in fact, the Satanic Bible, for those that are listening, it, it's, it's, a, it's absolutely the opposite of the Christian Bible. Okay. And so it takes like the, where Jesus says, turn the other cheek. Right. The, Satanic, the Satanic Bible says to do just the opposite and to smite him back on his cheek. Um, it says, you know, it's foolishness to love your enemies, which it is worldly speaking foolishness to love your enemies it takes a miracle yes to do that yes. and I just couldn't comprehend that obviously because I wasn't converted yeah so as I'm sitting there in this juvenile detention center I mean I wanted my life to end but I wasn't going to surrender my Satanism and uh, and so I was kind of known early on in the juvenile detention center as, as a Satanist and I was scratching satanic symbols you know my bunk bed and everything and I was under like 24-hour surveillance uh, but I eventually began, I was good enough to start earning some privileges, and they let me have some books in and, and the, and the Juvenile Detention Center. And that's really where my life began to change. Because it was your own mother who was a believer, but maybe a nominal Christian, we could say, in her life, just from all the circumstances she was facing. But it was your mother who encouraged you to read the Bible, right? Oh, she, yeah, I, you know, you get like a 10-minute phone call once a week. Yeah. And so my mom, she asked me, she said, son, do they have any Bibles in there? And I, I, I could look across the room and I could see on the, on the bookshelf in the day room of this juvenile center that there was some Bibles and, and I had no intention on picking one up. But she wanted me to read one and, and, uh, and I just, I brushed it off. But you know the incredible thing, Shelley? I'm, day after day as I would walk past that bookshelf coming back from my shower, I would, there was something that was just piercing me about that book, about, about a Bible. And I finally got it in my head. I had a solution. I was going to take a Bible, I would take it back to my cell, and I would prove it wrong. You see, the Satanic Bible says that, uh, that the Christian Bible is riddled full of contradictions and errors. And so it was a simple, simple task. Find the contradictions, find the errors, and put the Christians in their place. Okay. And so I, I snuck the Bible, sort of, I snatched it on the cell before anybody could see me. I have to say something. I had something. a reputation. I have to say something. Here you are, a straight F student. But you were really a smart kid, and you well, are, th I mean, obviously, you're an intelligent person. Well, I read a lot. think that. Okay. I read a lot. And, I, and I, even when I was a kid, even I wasn't getting any good grades, um, I learned to read when I was young. And uh, you learn to read, and you can do anything in okay. your life. All right. But, so you take this Bible back. You're going to prove it wrong. Yes. And I, I open it up. Of course, you begin a Bible or a book in the beginning. So that's all I knew the Bible was. And I began to read. And I started there in Genesis chapter 1, and I read, and I read, and I read. And of course, when you're locked in your cell about 23 hours a day, you can do a lot of reading. And so I, I was, I mean, I was encountering stories I had never heard of before. I mean, fantastic stories. I mean, of a global flood and of a sun standing still. I mean, can you imagine reading these things for the very first time in your life? Giants in the land. And I always thought, you know, David and Goliath was a myth. 
I didn't know it was from the Bible. Huh. And, uh, but here it is right in front of me, all these incredible things happening. And even though I was hardened against this, and by the way, not finding the contradictions and errors, but even as hard as I was, the power of the word just has a way to pierce the heart. Yes. yes. And, and I was being softened the whole way through. And I began to sympathize with God. Because these people that God was always chasing were some stubborn people. Okay. And I'm like, you know, get rid of them already. I, I've really sympathized with Moses, you know. Um, I'm like, when God says, I'm just going to destroy him and start over with, Mo with Moses, I'm like, yes, start over with Moses. They don't have anything coming. Yeah. And, uh, but Mo Moses, he, you know, answered that call to, to stand up and say, please, God, save your people. Yeah, if and you want I didn't a, understand that. If you want to, I mean, I, to think of that love for Moses to be able to stand up and say, yeah. Lord, blot my name yes. out of your book of life and save your people. I mean, he was a prefiguring Jesus Christ. I mean, that mm -hmm. love was in his heart. He was ready to give up his eternal life. And that's a love I had people. never seen. I'm not sure I ever met a Christian in my life. Yeah. When I, when I, what I mean by that is just somebody demonstrating that spirit yes. of Christ, like Moses did, like Saul, uh, like Paul did later. Yes. And and I and I wonder if I would have met somebody with that selfless love, what it would have done to me. Yeah. But I tell you something. When I saw it and kept reading, I mean, even though I didn't understand it, I knew it was something I wanted. But yeah. it wasn't later on until I got to the story of David and Saul. Uh, I think this is First uh, Samuel chapter 24. Mm -hmm. We have Saul pursuing David. Remember the story? Right. And David flees into the cave, and Saul has to use the bathroom, so he goes into the cave. And while he's in there, uh, David sneaks up behind him and cuts off right a little corner of that robe. And and you know, and this was the opportunity. And I'm like rooting on with his generals, like, get him. Now's the time to get him. You know, he's, he's pursuing your life. Now take his. And, but when he said, I can't do this. Can't touch the anointed. Of I God. can't touch the anointed of the Lord. And when Saul goes out, David goes out behind him. He holds up that, that little corner of that robe. And I can just imagine the, the, how low Saul's jaw just dropped when he saw that. You'd and think then, that would have turned him around, huh? Well, it did for a moment. For a moment. You know, you yeah. know what I'm saying? For a and it just, it really touched his heart. And he said, you've been more righteous than I. Yeah. He said, you've returned me good for evil, where I've returned you evil for yeah. good. And so I, I, when I saw that story, li listen, this, is the, this was the turning point in my Christian experience. Well, really? The beginning of my Christian experience. Really? really? I saw that Saul deserved to die. And David had every right to take his life. Yes. But David chose to have mercy. And so for the first time in my life, I am in Saul's shoes feeling the condemnation, the guilt, the heaviness, the, 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 the reality that I deserve to die for what I have done. Not just in the crime where I assaulted this good man, but for all the crimes I have done. And yet God still extends his arm of forgiveness, his Amen. arm of mercy. Amen. And says, look, and you just, like, just like David held up that cloth. So Jesus pleads his blood for you and me. And I tell you, just to taste that, it brings me back to it right now. Just, it's just remembering that the goodness and the, and the grace of God that can save somebody. And that's where I began my Christian experience. Hey, but right you know what I'm sitting here thinking is the power of the word. A 15-year-old mm -hmm. child locked away in detention center, no formal education at this point. I mean, you could read well, but you're, you're partying and just flunking out oh, yeah. of school. And just you and God, the Holy Spirit, alone in this cell, He is teaching you. But now God also sent some people to you. Tell us about the people who came to visit you. Well, that, that comes a little later. Listen, there's mir oh, miracles, okay. miracles start happening at this time. I am, um, you know, now I'm reading the Bible not to find the contradictions, not that they were there, but I couldn't find them anyway. But now I'm reading the scriptures to see what's in it for me. What, 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 what kind of teachings are in here? And I kept reading, I read about how David, he had committed sin with Bathsheba and later was rebuked by Nathan. Of course, he murdered his husband, which, you know, now here's the same David who gave mercy. And now he is in the place of needing mercy. Yes. And when he received that mercy from God, now he still suffered the consequences of that yes, sin, by the he way. Did. Yes, he did. And at that moment, I realized even if I become a Christian, that doesn't mean God's going to send a key to unlock these doors. Right. I realize there's still consequences for my crimes, but there could still be mercy. I could still be saved. And so as I 
as I kept reading, I came into Psalm 51. And you know, I'm going to share this with I you. I love Psalm 51. And greatest there, greatest Psalm of repentance. If you ever want to yes. know how to repent, just read Psalm 51. And this Psalm is directly connected with that story of Bathsheba. Absolutely. Uh, uh, being in, in the adultery as well as... Uh, um, this is after Nathan had approached David, and yeah. this is how David responds. But listen to some of these words that David wrote. Yes. He says, "Have this is verse 1, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Amen. Blot out my transgression. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Mm -hmm. Now, I read all of this, and I, I'm, I'm just floored at the poetry of this, the beauty of it, but also the heart cry, because it became my heart cry. Amen. And then I came to these words in verse 14. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God, the God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of your righteousness. I, I, and if ever that has come true, those words God has fulfilled in your life. I, I, I doubted for years. I mean, and it took me a long time to, to, to really, really understand what it means to be clean of the Lord. I struggled yeah. with guilt for years because of what I had done Amen. and forgiveness. But I, I know 100% that Jesus and the Father are true, and when they say they forgive you, they do indeed. And I believe that I've been cleansed from this blood guiltiness, just That's, as David was. Absolutely. But it took a long time to realize that. I struggled absolutely. with that for years, but I know, and there's people out there who's done worse things than I have, but God can forgive them just the same. Yeah. So, as you said, though, there were still consequences, and I'm glad to hear you say you recognized there would be, because it wasn't just jailhouse religion. You weren't getting in there saying, okay, Lord, I'm going to accept you if you will set me free. Right. You knew he was going to set you free in a different way, but you mm -hmm. did actually, you were tried, you were sentenced. Yes. Well, I was, I was certified as an adult. I was now 16 years old, so they sent me to county jail. I was 17. I turned 17 in county jail. When I was in county jail, uh, I met tons of other people that were, I mean, talking about jailhouse religion, I mean, literally, uh, they left their bu Bibles on the bunks when they left. You know yeah. how I knew this? Because they came right back. And I saw them again and again. Yeah. But I was eventually went to court and because I was guilty. I was no longer denying what I did. I was guilty. And so I asked the judge. I didn't go to trial. I didn't, uh, I just, I, went, I didn't even take a plea bargain. I just said, just said, judge, I did what I did. I, you know, my, my attorney tried to get me off because I was on, you know, psychotropic medications and I was, you know, all these different issues in my past. But I said, Judge, I'm guilty. Have mercy. And uh, after deliberating on the sentence, he came back and he said, uh, taking everything in consideration, he felt that uh, I deserved 20 years in prison. And so I was sentenced to 20 years in prison. And that's when they shackled me up and sent me off. Uh, this is in the prison of Missouri. And... Um, I actually was in four different prisons over time there. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, that, and this is where, I mean, just in my life is just a story of miracles, Shelley. And I know you know about miracles, but listen, being a firsthand account of all these miracles in my life, God protected me for all those years I was incarcerated. And when you think about a 16-year-old child going to prison, to the big house, if you will. I was 17 by the time I went to the prison, 16 in county jail, which in my opinion, county jail was worse than prison, but uh, it, was, okay. it was rough in county. But to think that you went off to the big house, but you didn't go alone. God was with you. Absolutely. So, Jeremiah 1.9, one of my amen, favorite scriptures. Amen. I quoted that almost every day. I bet. But now, and, and we want to kind of fast forward this because I want to take the remaining time or, or a good portion of time to talk about what God has done in your life. But let's do talk about several things. God did send someone to you in prison mm -hmm. who ended up baptizing you. Yeah. Tell us how you became, you were a Christian. How did you become an Adventist Christian? Well, I it actually dated all the way back to juvenile detention. Another miracle, my mom sent me a strong concordance. And so I began, as I became a Christian now, I wanted to understand the Bible. And my mom wasn't even sure what book she was getting me. She went to the bookstore and said, what should I send my son? He's locked up. And so she sent me a new Bible and a Strong's Exhaustive Concordance. And with that, I began studying the scriptures. Now, it would take me a couple of years to be an Adventist, but I began studying back then. The second miracle was my dad getting me a Walkman radio. And I began to listen. This is in Springfield, Missouri, where I was locked up in the juvenile detention center. And so there's lots of Christian radio. And I began to listen to all these different preachers. And as I began to filter through all these things, I realized that uh, uh, 
that there are so many teachings. I want to know what the truth is. Yes. So I began to write all these churches and ask, what do you believe? What do you believe? And, and when they sent me their beliefs, I compared them to the scriptures. And then uh, one lady uh, gave me a book called The Great Controversy. And so I read that through that book, and I breezed through that thing in just a couple weeks. And I tell you, it was uh, an incredible journey. But I began to see in that book confirming all the things I've seen in the Bible and, and just all these things adding up. When I was sent to county jail, uh, I received some more books that uh, were saying the same things. And, and just providence led me right to this church. But because I, so I decided in, in county jail, this is the year 2000, I decided to become an Adventist, a Seventh-day Adventist. Okay, so you were still in county, so you were mm -hmm. then baptized? But I couldn't be baptized oh. in the jail. There was no place to get baptized. Oh, okay. And so that's whenever I actually went, uh, after I was uh, uh, sentenced to the 20 years, I went to the prison. I did everything I could. So I began to write all these churches all across uh, my area, and nobody was responding. But two eventually did. One church responded, and they actually started a prison ministry in that prison. Oh, and great. listen, these, these brothers are incredible. And the second one is, uh, is Pastor Dan Kaffenberger. And this pastor, he actually was able to come into the prison and baptize me. And there and, he is. Uh, yes. And these are dear sisters up on, on the screen. These dear sisters came with him. And uh, because I was, oh, I was pretty obedient, so I got privileges. They actually was able to bring food uh, in on a food visit. Wonderful. And uh, it was good vegetarian food, it was quality <laughs> stuff. Good. All right, so, and are they the ones, I know that you told me when we were talking in the green room that you actually got to listen to 3ABN or watch 3ABN on DVD when you were in prison. That's cool. I, there was actually a brother named Robert. Robert was a volunteer. He was, he was an older gentleman. Uh, he's passed away since, but he would come in faithfully uh, along with these other prison ministers like, like, like Brother John and, and Doug. But they would, he would come in, and he, he wasn't a preacher. But what he could do is bring uh, DVDs. And so he would show Brother Kenneth Cox every, every Sabbath he came in. We'd watch uh, Brother Kenneth Cox on the screen. But he would leave us with a DVD that was four hours of packed 3 ABN material. So he would just record at home on his DVD-R 3 ABN. And then he would bring it in and he would leave us the DVD. God. And so we could go to the chapel and just watch it there. So I'd watch four hours of 3 ABN about every two weeks. And that's, that's all I knew about 3ABN. And I tell you, since that day, I said, we've got to get 3ABN into prisons. Amen. We've Amen. got to do it. Well, we know that there's 3ABN. God is opening so many doors for 3ABN in prisons. And mm -hmm. we want to just say hello to all of our brothers and sisters who are Amen. behind bars. Amen. And we do have many brothers and sisters behind bars. But uh, glory I to God. But I think every prison and the United States, around the world even, should have 3ABN. And I don't know if there's ways we can do that, but uh, it well, definitely has a lot of support. The Lord is really opening a lot of doors. And Brian Hamilton, uh, I'll have to introduce you afterwards. Uh, he is the director of finance here, but he is also our CFO. He has, God has put it on his heart to mm -hmm. become very actively involved in prison ministry. So 3ABN mm -hmm. has a prison ministry now. And then we have two ladies upstairs Praise who God. answer all these prisoners and send them Bibles and things. It's a beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. But now we only have about 10 minutes left. So what I'd like to do is you spent 14 of those 20 years in prison and God got you released six years early. Amen. Tell me how he took you from prison to being a Bible worker. Well, who wants to hire somebody fresh out of prison? So I was 29, getting out of prison. I've never had a driver's license. I've never had a job. I have no what a education. Shock. Well, it wasn't so bad. I prepared myself for it. I did all, I researched did. and studied and did everything I could, staying up to date to be prepared as best I could. But that didn't change the hearts of those I was applying jobs. So 40 job applications. Nobody wanted to hire me, Shirley. I mean, who would? I, mean, I have a violent crime history, no work history, no really education to speak of. I got my GED while I was locked up and took some college classes. But I just, there was, there was nothing attractive about me. I learned computer science when I was locked up in prison. Uh, praise God for many opportunities I was given. But I just, nobody wanted to hire me. So. With it, without a job, I just went to the church and volunteered. We went door to door, uh, knocking and giving, doing surveys and trying to give Bible studies. And uh, and eventually, the same pastor who I was going with door to door said, "You know what? I've been talking with my churches. We're really interested in a Bible worker. Would you be willing?" This is the first 
job offer I've had. They said, we've got a place in the church basement. It's not finished, but we'll work on it. And it's not, we can't pay you much, but we'll give you something. And, and I said, well, praise God, let's do it. Be a Bible worker. So what's that all about? So I had to learn what it meant to be a Bible worker. Mm -hmm. But listen, we, I've seen so many souls come into the church through uh, the work we did, um, going door to door and, and doing uh, Bible studies in people's homes. Amen. It's been incredible. Amen. Uh, now, you, obviously, we've announced that you are the an associate speaker and evangelist for Amazing Facts. What I want to understand is your conversion, uh, or we'll, if we have a moment, we'll go back to that a little bit more, but did, when you came out, you're a Bible worker. Did you write this book before Amazing Facts or after Amazing Facts? I wrote a little pamphlet of just the conversion story and the grace that God has given me in my life. Okay. And uh, I sent that to a friend. He took the liberty of sending that to Remnant Publications. And it sat on a desk at Remnant Publications for several years. And after I was released, I get a phone call one day and says, Hey, I just we just read this thing. And, uh, and there's a little big story behind this, but we want to publish your book and you have to finish. So I spent another year, I was a Bible worker at the time, I spent another year writing the book and the book actually came out the same time that I went to AFCO and trained with Amazing Facts. And, uh, and so I was actually picked up at the same time to do full time of public evangelism uh, while I was out there. So incredible. listen. The miracles don't stop, and the, and the book is packed with them all the way through, and how God protected me. Not one fight during my entire time that incarcerated. That is amazing. Um, God's promises are powerful. Amen. But uh, anyway, the uh, God, even when I was a Bible worker, preaching an evangelistic series during that time gave me some experience, and uh, and ever since we've been doing full-time evangelism all across this country, around the world. I've been to uh, Thailand and... Um, in fact, we, uh, we just baptized lots of people in Thailand this last December, and we had uh, in Nepal a year before that, we uh, did some work there and, and uh, did prophecy seminars in Thailand, or in Nepal. So it's, it's uh, been an adventure where God has sent me, and we just keep working for Him wherever He sends us. Okay, so the book is called The Least of the Least, From Crime to Christ, and you can get this book... Uh, at Remnant, yep, and that would be what uh, remnantpublications.com, or is it also available on your website? If you go to my website, endtimehope.org, and End Time Hope Ministries is our uh, the name of our prophecy seminar. It's the name of our ministry where we also help send these books into prisons. Mm -hmm. um, but if you go to End Time Hope Ministries, excuse me, endtimehope.org, uh, you can find ways of also getting the book there. Okay, and there's also an ebook version as well. Wonderful, and. Tell us a little bit about your time at AFCO and how God, I mean, there's a lot of people who go to AFCO. I've taught out there myself, and, and uh, you see that there's a lot of people come through. There's very few people that are selected to be the speakers and evangelists representative of AFCO. So tell us a little bit how God arranged that. Well, I'm not sure all the behind the scenes. Uh, God, I think, has been working on this for a long time. Uh, no even, doubt. Even in meeting my wife and everything just worked out so perfectly. But, uh, you know, the fact that they don't choose a lot of people to be evangelists or full-time Bible workers doesn't mean that there's not quality there because these students that come through AFCO uh, are the cream of the crop. They, yes. they are definitely solid. And uh, it's just there's only so many, I guess, positions available. And so uh, how the Lord worked it out that it was me, I mean, I... Uh, when we went, we I thought I was getting some more training to go out and be uh, uh, to continue doing the Bible work somewhere else, and but the Lord had other plans. We weren't there long before the offer was given, and so I spent most of my time at AFCO, knowing uh, what our future was going to be, and so studying extra hard with that in mind. But uh, and I can tell you, looking back, that this has been nothing but uh, divine. God has been in this from from the beginning, and. It's been more miracle stories. Now, when when you were there, you were already married. Is that correct? We went there. And in fact, we'd already had a baby at that time. All right. So let's let's back up just a little bit then. You've, you're out of prison. You're a Bible worker. How long were you out of prison before you met your wife? Uh, yeah, I'll tell you what. My wife will be on a little bit. You ask her that question. And she's, um, but we, I wasn't out too long because I wasn't, I was, I had a two-year plan. 
Okay. I wasn't going to get involved in a relationship for two years. I realized getting out of prison, there's a lot of adjustment to take. But uh, I had a two-year plan, but the Lord had different plans. And look, again, looking back, I can see that, that God had a, um, a rush order on this thing uh, <laughs> to get us where we're at today, where we can uh, do as much good as we can. But, the, uh, but God sent her into my life pretty early, and we began to, uh, to court. And I met her. This is actually a, a picture we took this at a camp meeting. This is the beautiful Jenny. That's yes. my wife, Jenny. Um, she's, uh, you know, and from the beginning, we both knew, even though it took us a long time to admit it to each other, that we were meant, that when I first met her, I knew she was the one. And she said the same about me. And I, I tell you, we didn't tell each other this for a long time, but uh, it, was, it was definitely Providence that brought us together. And so we got married in uh, June of 2013, and about 10 months later, we uh, had our beautiful daughter, Purity, Purity Allen. And she yeah. is a beauty. We're going to meet her. I, can't, I feel like I keep teasing people. We need to go ahead. Actually, what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead, and right now, Wyatt is doing prophecy seminars. He, uh, you just did uh, last, or in 2015, I believe it was, he did a uh, week of prayer at Oklahoma <laughs> Academy. He's traveling, speaking, and he and his wife and Purity are pretty much on the road constantly, aren't yeah, you? We, uh, You're living. We have no place to lay our head. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but, and, which uh, is um, I asked if you all were going to have another child soon, and he said, this is a little difficult time right now to when you don't know yeah. where you're going to be. So, But if you would be interested in having Wyatt come and do a week of prayer or speak at your church, or perhaps you would like to book them for prophecy seminars, we want to put up the address roll so that you can know how to get in touch with Wyatt. If you would like to know how you can get the book, The Least of the Least, From Crime to Christ, then you can write to End Time Hope Ministries, Post Office Box 1681, Jefferson City, Missouri 65102. That's End Time Hope Ministries, Post Office Box 1681, Jefferson City, Missouri 65102. You can call 573-280-4827. That's 573-280-4827. Or you can visit them online at endtimehope.org. That's endtimehope.org. I know that Wyatt and Jenny would be happy to come to your church and to bless you. And I do want to encourage you. I will be forthcoming with you. I have not had the opportunity to read this book yet. I just got it in my hands today, but I happen to have an autographed copy now. I have, however, spoken with several people at 3ABN who have read the book and said it was a compelling story, one they couldn't put down, one that they found so much encouragement. And the title of, the, of Wyatt's book is The Least of the Least. By the way, that's based on Matthew 25. Yes. Remember the story? If you yes. look at that list of leasts, it, I mean, the bottom of that list, you know, I was hungry, you fed me, I was thirsty. At the bottom of that list, he says, I was in prison and you came to me. That in the list of leasts, the least of the least are, are those. those in prison. And yet he didn't leave them out. Yes. That's incredible. It is incredible. So the least of the least from crime to Christ. And you can get this either uh, at remnantpublications.com or you can go to end time, time hope, hope endtimehope.com. Or, I, okay, let me say that one more time. Endtimehope.org or Amazon.com. Sure. Is it in the ABCs yet? It's in a lot of ABCs. Okay. Yep. And you can also check with the ABC stores. And w I'm really looking forward to reading this. And what we're going to do now is we're going to go to a news break. And when we come back, we're going to introduce you to Ginny, Mama Ginny, and Precious Baby Purity. Oh, well, we're really excited right now. We have Jenny and Purity joining us. And Jenny, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. 
I can see he has a penchant for pretty girls. <laughs> <laughs> Wyatt, you did yes. very nicely. And how old is Purity? She'll be two on April 30th. April the 30th. And I wish, quit rubbing those big, beautiful brown eyes. Here, you want another flower? We'll just tear one off for you. There you go. Mm. Yes. <laughs> and it's something that, I, there was something I was going to ask you, Miss mm. Purity. Well, that's all we can have right now. Let me ask you this question. When you met Wyatt, did you know immediately this was a converted man? Were you at all concerned about his background? Well, um, I mean, he was pretty upfront right away with um, what had happened in his, his life, and I really appreciated that. And so um, it didn't scare me. I could tell after a few conversations that he was definitely a converted man. Okay. And, um, just previous experiences that I had had, a friend who went to prison and also writing a few prisoners um, helped me to have a softer heart toward, um, it kind of opened the door for me to maybe even be, to open, open to even talking to him. Okay. So, yeah. Yeah. And it, and it didn't hurt that he was a nice looking oh, man. Oh. <laughs> I, <laughs> I was Dad. trying to figure out whose eyes she has. Oh. She's she favors them. daddy quite a bit. She's, oh, that's so pretty. Thank you. Thank you. Mm. Yeah. We're, we're teaching her sign language, so thank you. Thank that's oh. another skill I learned while I was locked up is sign language. Mm. That's and wonderful. So I've been able to try to teach her. Yeah. For, Do I want? Yeah. Oh, come here. Yes. Oh, come over shy. here. Let me see. Okay, your daddy is a blessed man. Yeah. Yes, thank you. How pretty. So, what's it like being on the road all the time, though? It's it's actually been a blessing. You know, the packing and unpacking is kind of hard, but uh, Purity's a pretty good traveler. How good? <laughs> when she's had how good that is. Yes. Um, good. Yeah, it's, it's been a joy. We're, we're planning on, by God's grace, getting an RV in the near future so that Amen. it's more settled. Some Amen. people say, oh, that, that doesn't seem more settled than, than uh, a place to stay, but uh, the RV will give us some stability yeah. for purity and for our family. Oh, say we didn't get a nap and we're restless, huh? Yeah. Well, well, you know, Jenny often says that she's our M&M baby, our <laughs> ministry and missionary baby. <laughs> and because she Except does, she, today, she travels huh? so well. And yeah. just, uh, she Oh, that's has, what uh, she needed was mama's touch here. Yeah. But now she's never seen television either. She's watching <laughs> she's herself. Watching the screen over yeah. there. Yes, unfortunately, she has not watched a lot of 3ABN, but. <laughs> well, but. <laughs> Some tiny tots for Jesus a few times. Yeah, we have. We get that on the internet. So what is the plan for the future for you all? We go where the Lord sends us. You know, my motto is the same as Jesus, to be about our Father's business, always watching, working, and waiting. And, and you know, we, um, we're at his disposal. So if he wants to change gears and do something else, we're happy for that. Uh, but as it stands right now, we just, we, we're preaching the gospel from church to church, from community to community. And we're seeing people just responding to these precious three angels messages, a uh, message that doesn't just, uh, uh, you know, convert people into being Christians, but actually uh, uh, transforms their entire life Amen. and prepares them for heaven. And so we just have a burden to tell the world as many as we can, as much as we can, as soon as we can. Amen. And, uh, and so the Lord's blessing with the family to do that. Uh, he sent me to prison for 14 years to make sure that uh, I would have the seminary training. That's where, that's where I got <laughs> I my know, seminary right. training to, um, yeah. to be able to do this. And I, I never saw it. I never imagined it. But mm. uh, the Lord, um, he is surely in this. Yeah. Did you know when you married him, I mean, because you married him before AFCO, did you, did you see this as your life, all of this traveling? Or you just... Um. The Lord kind of prepared me for that as well because okay. I was actually a traveling baby nurse before I met him. So I was used to going from place to place, but I wasn't sure. I knew that he was a Bible worker and that ministry was definitely something on my heart and that it was on his. So I didn't know that we were going to be traveling evangelists, yeah. but um, actually I was uh, brought into the church by a, a prophecy seminar, Bible prophecy seminar, and that was, it's neat to be now on the other side um, sharing that message and doing prophecy seminars 
Oh, another yeah. incredible miracle. Yeah, and I'm sorry we're oh. not going to have time for any hey, more miracles. Hey, listen, they're in, they're in the book. They're in the book, so. and the book is uh, The Least of the Least from Crime to Christ by Wyatt Allen. And we want to thank you so much for joining us today. Bye-bye. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you always. Amen. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.